Welcome to Calvary Oak Cliff. We're so glad you decided to join us today. We hope that you will listen carefully as our pastor shares God's Word. And then we hope that you will respond in whatever manner God leads you to. I have an announcement. Uh, yesterday, we had a, a good work day at the uh, storage facility. We took out a lot more of the church's belongings and took it to the new location. And we were able to consolidate three units down to one now. It's just left. And this a new announcement is that in the next couple of three weeks, we are looking for volunteers to come to the new church location and assist in unpacking and placing uh, the things that we have brought to help get them in their proper place. There's plenty of work for everybody. You don't have to be a strong man to do it. Just be able to move about. Uh, so you ask when uh, can I come? If you will call the new church phone number 972-913-4794 and check to see if Miss Mary is in the office. Uh, she'll be more than happy to help you if, you, if you come down. The last four. The last four. Uh, say the number again. 972-913-4794. Again, God bless you for joining us today at Calvary. Amen. Sorry, Janice is coming to read our scripture. Our scripture this morning is found in Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 7. If you would stand as I read Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 7. Surely he took upon us our iniquities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Amen. Good morning, good morning, Calvary Oak Cliff, Calvary at Lakeside, people on Facebook, we're so glad you've joined us here today. Let's start off with praise and worship. And happy Palm Sunday. We
Morning, Kyle. Morning. Morning. Um, so we got the door ties right here. We have the place right here on the side. And then if you want to do it online, it's uh, Calvary Oak Cliff, a lakeside, the org. Um, so anybody online, it's not even. <laughs> <laughs> I keep forgetting. But uh, you can do it online, um, talk to Pastor. And uh, so let's bow our hands, please. Heavenly Father, I want to praise you, Lord. Praise you for this time together that we have uh, to fellowship, to worship, just to be here, Heavenly Father, to be able to be in your house, Heavenly Father. Dear Lord, I pray that you, play, uh, that I pray that you bless these uh, offerings, Heavenly Father, this, uh, just to further your kingdom, Lord. Mm -hmm. Thank you for always blessing us, Heavenly Father, with everything that, that we need, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Just to recap, it's calvaryoakcliff.org. Or come on down and bring it in person. We'd love to see you. Love to have you. Let's carry on with praise and worship this morning, please.
trembles at his voice.
message from the Lord. Good morning, everybody. God bless you. Good morning. Hope you had a blessed week and you have another upcoming blessed week. Welcome to Calvary, at least currently, Oak Cliff. <laughs> Those that are watching by way of video, welcome. It is our prayer that God is glorified. Amen. And that he would use this service to reach hearts. Yes. Not only here, but there as well. In the cyber world of the internet. Father God, we want to just praise you and glorify you, Lord. We love you this morning. We thank you. God, we thank you for allowing us to be in your house. First day of the week, being in the right place at the right time. Thank you for the freedom that we have to worship you corporately as a body of believers. Thank you, Father God, that we're able to come together in person and just enjoy you, enjoy one another, and enjoy being in the presence of your Holy Spirit. So God, we pray that you are glorified. We pray that you would use everything that goes on here in the service to not only glorify yourself, but to reach hearts and draw people unto yourself. And God, we pray that if there's any that might be listening, who has never made a commitment to Jesus as Savior and Lord. God, that you would speak to them this morning and that you would use this message to further your kingdom that they might come to the knowledge of the saving grace that's found only in Christ. We love you and we praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people, sir. Amen. 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 So, this is an upcoming Passion Week. Actually, today would be considered Palm Sunday. Friday would be considered uh, the Crucifixion, which is Good Friday. But because we're not having a Good Friday, and that's where we're gonna be at today. But here's, here's the thing. You know, many people walk around with crosses hanging around their necks. Some people have crosses in their wings. Some people are tattooed with crosses. But what does the cross mean to you? You can be sure of one thing, that the cross represents death. It represents, represents death, and today we will be talking about the significance of the cross. And you probably figured out by now that the title of the message is the cross. Now normally we have PowerPoint, but my phone is not cooperating with internet for whatever reason, but preach the word. Amen. In season yes. and out of season. Amen. With a PowerPoint or without a PowerPoint. God's word still, as scripture tells us in Isaiah, goes out and accomplishes what is set out to do, Amen. not returning to him, God, void. We're going to be in uh, 1 John 4, 9 and 10. Just two verses that are packed with power. I want to ask you to stand so that we can read God's Word. You may not have the ESV. If you do, read along with me. Again, 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. If you're healthy enough to stand, let's stand to our, our feet in honor of the reading of God's Word. And it reads as follows, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world, so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. <clears throat> Short book 
or should I say the letter? To be technically correct, it's a letter, not a book. It's a short letter. It's five chapters, but I tell you, I recommend people to read this over and over, not just once, twice, three times, four times, five times, over and over and over. And when you read it, you will see why. But these two verses, John starts off with this, and this is not the full passage, but you'll see the context of it here in just a minute. He says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. So in what? That God sent his son into the world. But also, I need to point out verses seven and eight, because seven says, beloved, let us not love one another I mean, I'm sorry, let us love, let us not love, right? Let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not, does not know God, because God is love. Amen. And what John is pointing out here is that the evidence of salvation, of another evidence of salvation, is not only a changed life, but a life that expresses love, one for the other. <clears throat> so now we're going to go back to verse 9. So in this, what we just read, the love of God was made manifest among us, and also that God sent His Son into the world. This is a fact. This has happened in real history at real time so don't let anybody tell you any different this was around three some scholars say six uh, AD but this has happened now not only do we find it in scripture but you also find the evidence of Jesus and what he did and how he lived in extra biblical references that's that means uh, references that are outside of the Bible that was not written by Christians. For instance, Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish historian, not a Christian. But in his history writings, he mentions there was a man by the name Jesus who, who was crucified. I'm not going to tell you the rest of that. I'll give next week away. But there's evidence in extra of biblical writings that this has happened in real time. Now, why is that important? Here's why that's important, because many people believe in the facts about Jesus Christ. You can get any average person off the street and ask them, uh, who is Jesus? And they can give you the facts. Facts doesn't necessarily mean that you have embraced the cross. You see, it becomes a personal embracement when you know Jesus Christ personally. Now, I don't mean personally, whereas you keep it to yourself, because that's not biblical. It's a personal relationship, yes, between us and God through Jesus Christ, but it's the idea that we worship corporately. The idea is that we tell other people about Jesus Christ, about the saving faith that's only found in Jesus Christ. Now, here's something else here. Love originates with God. Love originates with God. He is the one. You see in the same letter, John says, God is love. And perfect love casts out all fear. So God is the originator of love. In fact, the greatest commandment that Jesus said was to love God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all of your mind. And that there's a second one that attaches to that. And love your neighbor as yourself. In, in simple terms, love God and love people. God expects that. And God doesn't only expect it, He commands it. It's part of the commandment of, of God, not only in the Old Testament, but also in the New. 
You know, Jesus came on the scene. Uh, this is in the book of John. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. But really, it wasn't a new commandment the way that we think new would be brand new. But the word new actually means fresh. God's word does not change. You know, the Isaiah tells us that the grass withers and the flowers fade. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. Amen. In Matthew 24, Jesus says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but the word of God shall stand forever. Now that is a fact. God's word always remains to be the same. Now we go to the next a part of the scripture so that we might live through him now living through Jesus Christ based on what we know the idea is that the person or the one who is reading this has already received Jesus Christ so remember this little letter was actually written to saved people it was written to the church written to the people of God now non-believers can read it Sure, let's hope they do, right? Because maybe they'll get saved. But it was, the audience was mainly the people of God. So as John is writing this, the idea is that people have already received Christ. The only way that you can live through him is that you have to have received him and believe in him. Now verse 10 says, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he had loved us. Now, this doesn't even uh, reach the surface. I mean, there's just so more in depth of what I'm going to tell you right now. It is God. God is the one that initiates the relationship. You know, we say, we, we, it says, uh, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us in the same letter that he has loved us first. We don't love God, I and mean, we love God, but it's not because we love him, it's because he loved us first. Now we often hear somebody say, you know, uh, I turned to the Lord, or I invited Jesus into my life, or I invited Jesus into my heart. That's all fine, you know, at the beginning, but really, theologically speaking, it is not you who does the inviting. It is God, it is Jesus with open arms that says, come, all who will come, I will in no wise cast out. I will not turn you away. So keep that in mind, always. It's God as the initiator. In fact, God created us to have a love relationship with him. Not only you here, not only you watching, but the whole world. He has created people for a love relationship. Nobody was created to live life on their own. Although many people do, right? Or they, or they try to until they get sick and tired. Amen? Of being sick and tired of being sick and tired, and they come to the end of themselves, which is where God wants you, by the way. You back up against the wall, you flat, or you're flat on your, on your back. You have nowhere else to turn, nowhere else to look, except up. That's where God wants us. To realize that we cannot do this. We cannot live a life without God. Because we are created for the very purpose of having a love relationship. Although we try, unbelievers, we try and we try and we try. And we try to make relationships, you know, meaningful. And relationships to, you know, last. We try to look for this right man. Oh, if I can just find Mr. Right. Or if I can just find Mrs. Wright, and you come to find out they don't exist without Jesus. They do not exist. You know, bottom line, God, slowly sometimes, sometimes faster than others, he gives us a revelation is that when you find me, 
you have found life. Amen. You, you, you have your foundation. And nothing and no one will take that place. So if something should ever happen to the so-called Mr. Right or the so-called Mrs. Wrong, guess what? You are still standing on the foundation of God. Amen. And you are still able to praise God because your foundation wasn't built on a person. Yes. Now, that's not to say that we're not, you know, people cannot be in love. That's not to say that we treasure our wife or treasure our husband or our children, etc. Making the point is the priority is God. God takes second place to who? Nobody. No one. No one. Not family. Certainly not your job. Not to yourself. Not to material things. God takes second place to no one. And you'll see this open up a little bit more here. I love this word. I'm about to tell you. This word is so packed. So powerful. So much theological significance here. Here is where you get the meaning of the cross. And it's, it's, it's really perfect timing, right? Because on Wednesdays, we've been uh, talking about the prophecies that were prophesied about Jesus' death and we'll be talking about his resurrection. We just uh, finished justification, sanctification, and glorification. Now, I'm hoping, as I said last week, this is, all these messages are going to start, they ought to start for you connecting the dots and you understanding God with his Holy Spirit, obviously, illumines your mind. The Holy Spirit opens up the eyes of your heart. And you begin to see scripture, you know, the dots, and you're able to connect these dots. Wow. You know, just fascinating how God works. Fascinating how he works in scripture. And here it is. And sent his son to be the propitiation for us. It's a big theological word. It's only found three times in Scripture. Just three times. And they're all in the New Testament. The idea actually comes from the Old Testament. But the only, this word is only mentioned in the New. It's once in Romans and twice in the book of, or the letter of 1 John. Now, what does propitiation mean? It means appeasing anger. Appeasing wrath. And now I have to explain this just a little bit. Is that the idea is that the wages of sin is death. Right? The wrath of God, as we saw in this morning's writing in Isaiah 53, the wrath of God was on Jesus Christ. God has taken the sins of the world, which the wages of them is death. The New Testament, 1, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that God has taken the sins of the world and put it on him who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him, or in plainer English, that we might be in right standing with God because of what Jesus did. You see how it points to God and it points to Jesus? Nothing, nothing that we do. There's nothing that we can bring to the table. You know, the only thing that we bring to the table is empty hands. God, here I am. I have nothing to give. You know what God wants? Just one thing. He wants you. He wants you. All of this that he has done, he did it for you. He did it for people. As Good Friday approaches on Friday, you know, we call it Good Friday. It's, it's almost like an oxymoron, right? Good Friday. How can it be Good Friday when somebody died because of me, because of you? 
we call that Good Friday? People look forward to Good Friday. Why? Some get a day off. <laughs> but you know, there's so much more to it. Amen. And I believe that as we begin to understand the significance of the cross, God opens our eyes to what it really meant, to what it really means. Now hear this, everybody, you've probably done it like I have, but everybody in this world will come to a place where they're standing before the cross. And they're gonna to have to do something when they find themselves at the cross. Now, I'm speaking spiritually. They're going to have to make a decision. It's either going to be, yes, Lord, I receive what you've done for me at the cross, or it's going to be, I don't want anything to do with it. It's never going to be, I'm not ready, although that you may say that, but being not ready also means what? Nothing. So as you begin to hear what's going on here, for anybody to reject what God has done for them at the cross through his one and only son, it's like putting a fist to God. I don't care. God's wrath is still there. God's wrath is still on that person. Anybody walking without Jesus Christ, anybody living without Jesus Christ, they may not know it, but the wrath of God abides over them. In other words, something hanging over their head, if you will, in our language. Just waiting to be unleashed. Well, God has done something for us. God has done something to, to, for us to escape the wrath of God. And that is in His Son. That is what pro propitiation means, that at the cross, God's anger, God's wrath was appeased. It was satisfied, if you will. And stay with me, because again, you're going to be able to connect the dots here. Same author, under the inspiration of God. I love the writings of John. You have John, the Gospel of John, right? You have 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, which are letters to the church. And then what else do we have? Revelation. We have the revelation of God. If you read that, you'll see that it was Jesus that told him to write these things down. And that's how the, the book of Revelation came into me. But it's John. John was considered the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And of course he loves everybody. But there was just something about John. And you can see the difference, right, in, the, in his writings. I explained that here on Wednesday. And, and some of you already know this, I know. So if you watched it, you heard it, it might sound redundant here, but you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Great writings, right? Especially Luke, because Luke was a doctor. He was a historian. He's very detailed in his writing. And he was a Gentile, by the way. Very detailed. Those are called the synoptic gospel because they're similar to one another. But then you turn to the book of John. And what do you see in the readings? It's different. There's intimacy. You can just sense the intimacy that... John and Jesus and John had for the Word. Not only the Word of God, but the living Word, the Lagos. In fact, he starts off like that, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? He starts off the first book, the first letter. I keep saying book, it's a letter. First uh, letter of First John, chapter 1, verse 1. He says, in the beginning, or oh, I'm sorry, he says that we were witnesses. We beheld his glory. We touched him. He's testifying that this has happened. I was there. 
we beheld his glory. And there's a reason why he did that in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. If you were with me or with us through the study that we did, you know why. You understand why he did that. But then we have John 3.16. For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. What was the motivation of God giving his Son? Love. God so loved the world. That doesn't mean, you know, the the ball of the earth and the water. But the word here means the people that are in the world because we are his creation. We are made after the image of God. We are God bearers. And nothing and no one can change that. I just heard this past week. And I want to stay here. I just want to tell you because I, I need to make a point here. Somebody said, that DNA can be changed. I'm not even going to get into all the words of it, but what's the, the, the world in line for today? It's not going to work. But they're saying that once you do this, that your DNA can be changed, and you're not an image bearer of God anymore. And I had to correct that very quickly. Whoa, wait a minute. That is not true. Nobody and nothing can take the fact that you are made in the image of God. Amen. You are a God-bearer for life. No matter what yeah. you do on the outside, no matter what you try to do on the inside, cannot change the fact that you are made in the image yeah. of God. And by the way, we are the only ones on the face of this earth who is made in the image of God. Not the animals and certainly not the angels. We are the only ones that God has made in His image. Yes. Amen. Yeah. And nothing changes that. Now quickly, it says that whoever believes in him, speaking of Jesus, shall not perish. This word perish in the Greek means destroy or destruction, utter destruction, meaning that the person that chooses not to believe what God has done for them at the cross, that they become destroyed, eternally separated from God Almighty forever. This is why the gospel is so important. This is why it's so important that people who are not believers hear what God has done for them. Their eternal destiny is at stake here. In 17 it says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. He made a way. He made a way, God. Now, Scripture tells us, 1 Corinthians 1.18, that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us, you and me, say, it is the power of God. Amen. Now, it makes sense, right? Because people think, man, that's foolish stuff. Why would you believe in somebody who was supposedly being nailed to a cross and you think you're going to go to enter into eternity because of that. It's foolishness. They don't get it. But for you and I, it is the scripture says, it is the power of God. First Amen. Corinthians 118. Now, let me tell you what all of that means. Now, we understand thus far that it was God Almighty, again, especially with the reading of Isaiah 53, 4 through 7, it please God. Go home and read it again. Or God was pleased to do what? To crush him. Or to smite him. That was the only way. I mean, it's really amazing is that God is a just God. God demands justice for sin. And guess what he did? In his loving way, in his merciful way, in his graceful way, 
He not only demands justice, but he provided yes. justice mm -hmm. in the most loving, selfless way. Giving his son. I mean, who on earth would give up their child for the good of everybody else? And you know they're rotten. You know they're evil. I don't see any hands. Me either. But God did. God went beyond what any human would be willing to do is to give up his one and only son. Now listen to what happened. We know the story, right? By God's spirit, according to the scriptures, he over, overshadowed a young virgin, Mary, who they say was about 16, 17 years old. Out came Jesus Christ, God incarnate, God made flesh, God coming down to us. Not that we have to work ourselves up to him. That's religion. Trying to do all these things to reach God. Instead, God came down and he became one of us. Amen. In the person of Jesus Christ. Yes. Now we know the story. Jesus Christ went about doing good. Miracles. Yes. Feeding the hungry. Casting out demons. Saving the disciples from uh, a disaster. I mean, on and on and on. Nothing but good that he did. And then he was lied upon. In fact, one of his own sold him up for 30 pieces of silver. He told the religious people where they can find him who he was. The one that I kissed, that's the one. And he was a little remorseful. He didn't say repentant. You may have heard it on Wednesday. He was remorseful. He went back to give the money back. Nevertheless, damage done. They got Jesus. They couldn't find any charges that would stick, so they lied on him. People came and became false witnesses. Pilate, the governor, as he stood before the governor, he says, I find no fault in him after he had him scorched, after he had him whipped. And this was not any whip, maybe just ordinary whip. It was embedded with metal and stone. And he got whipped naked. They were supposed to do so many on the front side and so many on the back. Now, if you weren't a Roman, this wouldn't happen. But he wasn't Roman. In fact, they considered Jesus an insurrectionist, someone who was against the Roman Empire. Empire. But they beat him to a pulp. Every lash that went out against his body ripped open his skin. The book of Isaiah says that you couldn't even recognize him, that he was a person. He was disfigured. He was ridiculed. He was spit upon. His beard was plucked, being plucked at. And if that wasn't enough, which is, they say that most people ended up dead before they even ended up to Golgotha, which was the hill where they executed the prisoners or the insurrectionists. They made him carry his cross. Now imagine, you have a bare back, open, bloody. They made him carry this cross. Most were made out of crosses or some stakes. They say it was about 150 to 200 and they laid it across his back, forced him to carry his own cross until he couldn't carry it any longer. It was a Roman law. It was a mile, as you heard Jesus say on the Sermon on the Mount. Somebody asked you to go one mile, go two miles. Well, that was a law. 
And, and the Roman people knew that. Jesus couldn't go any further physically so somebody else carried his cross to Golgotha. But then when you get there, what did they do? You could have just, you know, okay, enough. This is enough punishment. But they didn't stop there. They nailed him to this cross. Naked. Shameful. They stuck him up in a hole for everyone to see. He was put on display for you and I among thieves, among criminals, one on his right, one on his left. He didn't deserve that. He didn't deserve to die a criminal death. But at the same time, it was fulfilling scripture. Hundreds and hundreds of years ago, this was prophesied that he would be laid with the robbers. We've seen that on Wednesdays. But here he is. And then they threw insults at him. You saved others? Come down and save yourself, and then we will believe you. They mocked him. And then what does Jesus say towards the end? Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Most people get confused about, well, if Jesus is God, then why was he calling out to uh, God? <laughs> Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment, remember, Scripture says that God had taken the sins of the world and placed it on him who knew no sin. The wages of sin, death. Someone had to take the punishment. Not just someone, not just anyone. It had to be perfect, unblemished. You see that on Wednesday. Unblemished, untainted, sinless. Jesus is the only one that fit that description. And there he is. He became this perfect sacrifice, paying the wages of sin, so that you and I, all those that put their trust in what God has done at the cross, might be in right standing with God. And yet he says, forgive them. Hmm. But here, it's crying out to God. People don't understand that in a split moment. At that moment, God the Father, because He's so holy, cannot look on sin. And for a split moment, God the Father had to turn His back on His one and only Son. Not only did He have to witness what was going on, how He endured this punishment that He did not deserve, but He also had to turn His back. And this is why Jesus cries out, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And it wasn't the beating that Jesus took. It wasn't the nails. I mean, he took that all very well, if you ask me. Yeah. But what hurt the most was that God the Father had to turn his back in order to accomplish something far greater. And finally, in the story, Jesus says these last three words, it is finished. And he hung there, and he died. Some of you know the story, the Romans came by, and they were piercing the side of the criminals. And they did that for the purpose of trying to speed up death, because they couldn't keep them up there at sunset. Besides, it was around the Passover time. So they wanted to rush to death, so they could get them down and bury them. When it came to Jesus, he was already dead. When they stabbed him, blood and water came dripping out. That is what we see at the cross. The movie, the passion, although it's a good movie, can never be as in-depth to what actually happened. Far greater than what we see in the movie, the passion. Romans 5, 8 through 11 says this. But God showed us his love. And while we were yet still sinners, 
Christ died for us. In other words, even in our mess, even in your past sin, your current sin, and your future sins, he knew it all together, but yet still chose to die for us. It says, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood. There's the word justification. Just as if I've never sinned. That is how you want to stand with God. At the end of the day, when we have to stand before God and give an account, you want to be able to stand before Him and God sees you just as if you've never sinned. Outside of Jesus Christ cannot happen. Does not happen. Will not happen. And then it says, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. There's a day coming. The wrath of God is coming. We don't know when. Nobody does, but it's coming. And then it says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life? More than that, he says, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. That means that you and I have been brought back in a relationship with God because of Jesus. Because of what he's done. Now don't miss this. John 3.36 Whoever believes in the Son, capital S, has eternal life. Mm -hmm. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. Mm -hmm. Now I have to tell you, in the Gospel of John and also in all of his writings, the word obey and believe, they go hand in hand. They cannot be divorced from each other. That's the way that he writes his writings. To believe is to obey. If you're obeying, it's because you believe. And it's, it's really uh, significant that he's done that in his writings. How the word has a word play on both words. But then it says, but the wrath of God remains on him. If whoever chooses not to receive what God has done for them at the cross, and you're not obeying what thus says the Lord, the wrath of God still abides. And, and the wrath of God, what is the wrath of God? Well, two things, and I'm not going to stay there, just to uh, cure your curiosity. The wrath of God is when God comes back, Christ comes back for his church. And we are raptured out of here, so to speak. All hell breaks loose here on earth. The wrath of God will be poured out on this earth. And two, the wrath of God is that one day those that rejected Jesus Christ will stand what scholars uh, say is the great white throne judgment, which you find in Revelation chapter 20 verse 11 until the end, 16 maybe. That they will stand before this great white throne judgment and they will give an account for what they did and what they didn't do. And whose ever name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life or cast into the lake of fire forever. That's the wrath of God. That's the final place that unbelievers will be. And some people don't believe it. You know, yay for the enemy, right? Because the enemy don't want you to depend. You're going to believe that stuff. Remember, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. But to us who are saved, it is the power yes. of God. In conclusion, there was a little boy who was lost. And he was crying. And some older man came by, walking by, and he sees the little boy sitting there crying. And he says, why are you crying, little boy? He said, well, I can't remember where I live. I got lost. And the man began to think for a minute. 
And then he came up with this question, is there anything that you remember? What's around your house? And the little boy said, well, I only remember one thing. There's a big cross across the street where I live. And immediately the man knew where he lived. Grabbed the little boy by his hand and he starts walking them to the church. And when he got to the church, they seen the cross and he says, I live across the street. The cross leads you home. The cross will lead you home. And Susan makes her way up here. What do you contemplate on just your walk with God? Where are you at in your walk with God? Where are you at in your knowledge of the cross?
God, we thank you for salvation in Christ. We know that we cannot save ourselves. If you're listening, if you're watching, and you have never received Christ as Savior and Lord, I want to point you to the cross. I can pray for you, but at the end of the day, it's your cry that God hears that saves your soul. And it would be something like this, God, here I am, a sinner. God, I understand that Jesus was crucified for my sins. I understand that you are a holy God. God, I choose to repent, changing my mind about my lifestyle, changing my mind about my sin in light of you, holy God. And I'm asking you to change my heart and empower me to live a changed life. If you do that, and if you've done that sincerely, genuinely, the scripture says that we will be like newborn babies. And a newborn baby craves milk. You will crave the milk of God's word, by which is the only way to grow in your faith. God, I pray for others, Lord, that we would understand the cross and know that our finite minds will never understand the ramifications that you see at and in the cross. But God, that if you would grant us a glimpse of the cross. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for you sending Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit today who guides us, who leads us, who empowers us. And those that have repented of their sins, God, it's only because of you. It's only because that you empower us to live the lives that are worthy of our callings. And God, we thank you. We love you. We honor you. God, we pray that we might represent you everywhere so that you would be glorified in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Tell somebody about your church, but more importantly, tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Let's stand to our feet as Susan comes to uh, bless us out one more time.
one another. Thank you for coming.